Thank you. Well, thank you to uh, thanks to the organizers for this wonderful workshop. It's nice to be here. Um, I originally prepared this talk to be about black holes and, or black hole perturbation theory. However, after talking to some of you, um, I decided that maybe maybe I could talk a little bit about axions given the nature of this workshop. So I added that. I suspect I won't have time to talk about all three topics. So probably roughly 20 minutes we spend on axions. 20 minutes on lock numbers. I don't think I'll have time to talk about crossing on one Okay. So, so this is a two-part talk. Uh, first, uh, I just want to um, um, give kind of a, a sketch of just some, some main ideas without going too much into the details. Okay, so it's very much like um, uh, an overview talk, if you want. Um, and, and in fact, this point I want to make is very simple. Uh, wave dark matter, what do we mean by wave dark matter? Well, uh, we are interested in dark matter in the wave regime in the following sense. We are interested in a regime where the typical particle separation is smaller than the Dirac wave um, Rho is the dark matter mass density that we know from measurements, from astrophysical measurements, that's a known quantity. From astrophysical measurement, we also know the typical velocity in a halo. For example, in the Milky Way, we would be about 200 kilometers per second. So those are astrophysical inputs. <coughs> and then you just ask, how do you satisfy this inequality? And you plug in the numbers, you get this number. If the mass is less than 30 electron volts or so, you will be in a regime depicted in this cartoon. You know, Imagine you draw a sphere with radius of the body wavelength. You have multiple particles in that volume, right? So that's what we we are going to mean when we say, okay, you are in the wave regime. Uh, we do not know. We we are very ignorant about uh, where the spectrum, this vast spectrum of dark matter mass, uh, what it could be. But at least there is a, a fairly interesting kind of dividing line. If you are above, you basically can think of it as a collection of particles. If you are below this number. It's more useful to think of it as a collection of waves. And just to give you a sense of scale, right? If you push the mass to be ultralight, like 10 to the minus 22 electron volts, in the literature is sometimes called fuzzy dark matter. The body wavelength in the Milky Way is actually very large. It's astronomical, 100 parsec. On the other hand, if you pick 10 to the minus 6 electron volts, which is the target mass of some axion detection experiment like EDMX. The, the body wavelength is of course a lot smaller, but it's actually still large, large in the sense that it's large compared to the experiment. Uh, and which actually means the um, the wave um, the, the wave phenomena are actually going to show up in these experiments. And that's also worth considering. So I'll be considering but Lan, this is still much smaller than the inter axion separation, right? This one for typical density. This one is actually larger. So, so again, the point is, if the mass is less than 30 electron volts, which 10 to the minus 6 is, you would have actually multiple particles. In fact, in this case, many particles in the body volume. Sorry, yeah. The, the, body, the, the body size for 10 to the minus 6 electron volts is 100 meter. And if you ask what is the interparticle separation given the known dark matter density in the solar neighborhood, it's a lot smaller. Yeah. So, how big? Oh, how big? Uh, you would you would have to do the math. Uh, I'm asking you this. Yes. Um, let me let me see let me see if I can infer it. Uh, so for for thirty electron volts, three GB per meter cube. Let's say yes. Typical yeah. distance. Exactly. So you can you can just do the math. No, exactly as we said, one GB per centimeter cube. You divide by this very small number, and you remember you have to take this to the minus one third power. You get a very small in the particle separation because the particle mass is so small. You need many in order to make up that one GE per cc, basically. Okay, so uh, so this is what we mean by the wave regime. Okay, now um, what what does this have to do with axions? Well, of course, uh, axion is kind of um, um, a, a, a rather interesting candidate for this kind of wave dark matter, basically very light dark matter. And I just want to run a very simple argument by you. It's very well known. So 
If you do the simplest misalignment mechanism, and by simplest, I mean the following. Suppose you have an axion or axion-like particle, um, and suppose the initial primordial misalignment angle, uh, which is basically the axion field value divided by, divided by the axion decay constant is order one, so it's not fine-tuned. And suppose the potential is just a constant, it's not even temperature dependent. Uh, you will get this, this kind of prediction for the relative density. The relative density would be of the order of what you need for that matter, provided you choose these numbers. Now for the axial decay constant and the axial mass. Uh, by the way, if you choose these numbers, you can convince yourself fairly easily this is clearly not the QCD axion. Uh, um, basically, lambda to the fourth is basically x squared and n squared. Uh, you know, you know, this is not the QCD axion if it were these numbers. Um, and for the QCD axion, you should do a, a more careful job. The potential is temperature dependent and so on. But roughly speaking, this formula roughly works. Uh, so it gives you a sense that, okay, if the axion decay constant were large, like, like so, uh, basically somewhere between gas scale and plant scale, then uh, the mass is really tiny, ultralight, like that to the minus 22. But of course, we really don't know what is this scale. And, and in fact, the relic abundance is more sensitive to your choice of F than your choice of M. Um, so we want to keep that in mind. And so in the end, uh, the mass can have a very large range, uh, assuming this very simple misalignment mechanism for the relic abundance. Right? Um, Okay, so so in this part, whenever I say the axion, uh, I don't really mean the QCD axion in general, axion-like particle, such as what you get from frame theory. So now, I, I yeah. guess you assume that that F will be below the reheating temperature, and you, so this will not happen above the pressure, right? Yeah, whether whether you want the um, the Patrick Queen symmetry bridging to happen before or after inflation, you, you have some option, of course. Uh, here, here, basically, I assume this happens actually already before inflation or during inflation, before reheating. Yeah. But if it happens after reheating, as uh, as you know, mm -hmm. then you can form axion strings and so on and produce that matter that way. So that is a whole other mechanism for producing axion that matter, which which is not so much about the misalignment mechanism. Yeah. Um, thanks for the questions. Um, so. Um, what I want to stress is actually a very simple point. As long as you have waves, you have wave phenomena, and it's best to just do your picture. So this is the picture. If you actually put this on a computer, so imagine uh, you have uh, axion dark matter, roughly homogeneous in the early universe with tiny fluctuations, and you just allow those fluctuations to grow with time, and just Evolve your 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 simulation forward in time. You will see something like this. You will see this is this is a a, a larger box. You will see basically filament structure, and you will see at the intersection of filaments you will see things that looks like halos, basically places where galaxies probably can form. But what is most striking, and you can already see in this picture. Uh, this interference pattern now. So along the filaments, you can see this constructive and destructive interference. The color coding here is basically density. So the, the, the darker density, the darker color is basically low density and vice versa. Um, and inside a halo, if you zoom in, it actually looks like this. You see all this uh, basically interference substructure. And this is inevitable because imagine you have a halo, which is a collection of waves. And let's say just for simplicity, the collection of plane waves. These waves in general, because this halo formation process is messy, these plane waves are going to have random phases. And if you superimpose them and you square to get the density, you are going to have interference pattern. It's inevitable. The size, typical size of these interference fringes, so to speak, is the, the broadly wavelength. That would be the typical size. If you tell me the velocity dispersion of the halo, you plug in this V, you basically would have the correct typical size of this uh, interference pattern, basically. And this interference pattern is not fixed in time either. It's going to evolve. 
and it evolved on the time scale, which is also very easy to estimate. You take the De Broglie wavelength and you divide by another power of B, that, that will be the De Broglie time. So to just to give you, again, a sense of scale, huh? if you, I do ultralights, the uh, time scale, the De Broglie time is actually very long, it's millions of years. Okay. Um, so what I want to do is to actually just point out a few interesting features of having this weighted wave interference structure. So transition interaction with the barriers which inevitably are there, yes. wouldn't it change this picture? It would. Let's move it out. It, it, uh, the, the baryons, it depends on basically um, whether you are baryon dominated or dark matter dominated. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, if you are in the region of the galaxy that's dark matter but dominated, then the baryon has a relatively small impact. But in places where baryon is actually very dominant, of course, it will have a big impact. So it depends on where you're looking, for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, let's, let's, uh, let's uh, think about this as follows. We are going to take the epsilon field, which I call phi here, and we are going to consider the non relativistic limit, which is very good for something like the Milky Way. The velocity is small. Um, the standard thing to do is to take the axion field, you factor out the, uh, the main time dependence, m is the rest mass of the axion, and you multiply by a complex scalar, often called the wave function, and of course you add complex conjugate to make it real, um, and the non-relativistic limit is basically saying uh, whatever time dependence of the wave function, this complex scalar field is slow, it's slow compared to one of n. So this is the fast time dependence, this is a slow time dependence. And um, once you take that limit, it's very intuitive what the dark matter density is. The dark matter density is just the axial mass times the number density, plus squares the number density. And in the non relativistic regime, if you work on the dynamics, uh, there is a U1 symmetry. Basically, it's just particle number conservation because in that limit, you don't create or annihilate particles. So you have that U1 symmetry. Um, so this is this is a fairly standard way to describe what is going on for <coughs> axions uh, in a non-relativistic halo. Now I want to zero in to a particular phenomenon which is uh, interesting, uh, which is basically these places you can see where you have destructive interference. The density becomes very low. And in fact, it's fun to think about cases where the destructive interference is actually complete, meaning it's all the way to zero. So let's think about that. So um, that's what I want to actually emphasize. And it turns out I want to convince you these places where the, the dist uh, destructive interference is complete, in general, they will form a line around which the phase would wind around. And so it is actually a form of vortex. <coughs> And it's actually very easy to convince the that that is true. Um, if I can have the chop so here, the chop very ah, thank you. So um so you have you have you have the wave function, and of course it has a real part and an imaginary part. And basically by the complete destructive interference, you mean basically there, there is some point at which both of these vanish, yeah. And if you ask yourself generically, what are the set of points where the real part managed, it will form some kind of surface in three dimensions, it will be some kind of surface. The set of points where the real part of psi takes a particular value in particular zero. And likewise for the imaginary part, you will be another surface and where they cross, basically form the line. And so you know, just by that argument, generically, you expect, um, these places of complete destructive interference that forms a line, basically this purple line. And moreover, if you write the uh, if you write the wave function as an amplitude, the amplitude is nothing other than the mass density divided by m, the square root, and a phase. You can convince yourself the phase is ill defined where psi is zero, where the amplitude is zero. When you have complete destructive interference, the phase is not well defined, but it's well defined away from it. And the only thing you could do is you go around this string, basically, 
the phase has to wrap around by integers of two pi, as, uh, as you can imagine. And so this is really like a vortex. And in fact, if you interpret it as a fluid, you can you can convince yourself the fact that this winds around means there is a net uh, velocity circulation that goes around. And that circulation is quantized. And so basically you have a vortex. And in general, these uh, vortex feedback, um, they do not just end suddenly. And so in fact, what you should have is vortex rings. So you find vortex rings. Um, I want to emphasize for those of you who think about axioms a lot, this is not the axiom strain, right? The axiom strain that we are familiar with, the U1 is the Petri Queen U1. Here, this U1 is more mundane. It's just the U1 associated with particle number conservation in the non relativistic limit. It's just that U1. It's more mundane. So these, these, uh, these vortex rings, they have some integrity to it, meaning they cannot just arbitrarily arbitrarily uh, disappear, for example. The only way they can appear and disappear is by the following process. You, have, you can nuclear a ring of zero size and then expand, and then it will move around, intersect with other rings, or it can shrink to zero size and disappear. But, that's the, but otherwise, you cannot just arbitrarily make them go away or appear, okay? Um, now, one might think this is very academic. In fact, as, at first we thought this must be very academic because how often by just random wave interference do you have complete destructive interference? It turns out it's not academic. It turns out it's very generic. Um, if you look at simulations, um, you can actually look for these things. And on average, statistically, you have one vortex ring per the body volume. So any the body volume you have, you should expect on average one more tax rate. So these things are actually very common. Um, I think they assume that there are no other particles in the same simulation, right? If you have barium, that's yes. an obvious one. Yeah, again, again, you know, it depends on whether the region is very undominated or not. Lamp, the yeah. fact that you have one of these rings that expands and then creates the shrink, this comes all out of gravity, really? Or are you assuming some interactions of the field? Of course, in the simulation, gravity is included. But if you want to just understand the basic dynamics of how these rings, what, what happens when they interact, what happens when they disappear, you don't even need to think about gravity too much. Yeah. It's, it's a very simple system. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm going to end this part of the talk by just saying, as you can imagine, there are a lot of possible implications for both astrophysical observation and experimental detection. Uh, in terms of astrophysical observations, uh, clearly it's most relevant when the wavelength is very large, right? That makes it easier to observe astrophysically. Um, unfortunately, I have to say the observational signal that we could come up with, they are not really. Uh, vortex ring specific because each individual ring does not produce a lot of signal. And so the only signals that we could actually come up with is always uh, statistical accumulated effect over scattering with many rings. So I'll give you an example. Um, for example, if you look at stars, imagine this is the Milky Way halo. Yeah. Um, Gaia data. Uh, have fantastic data of a globular clusters going around the Milky Way halo and get tidally stripped. You see these, these thin streams of stars. These stars are going to uh, encounter this stru structure that is actually dynamic and scatter these stars. And just by looking at constraining how, how much these stars get scattered, you can actually hope to put constraints on this or it may be even detect the presence of this kind of substructure. Similarly, there are signals that come from gravitational lensing uh, that work in a similar way, but both signals are not really ring this vortex specific, which we would, not, we would definitely like because it's such a distinctive uh, phenomenon. And by the way, the density profile is always L square, close to the ring. You can, you can so what's the typical show. mass of those clusters? Sorry? The on the right, what's the typical mass of those? The uh, typical mass of <coughs> those clusters of axioms. You mean the you mean in the De Broglie volume? In the whole structure. The, the oh, the image we see here. You mean you mean in the yeah. in the whole galaxy? The well, that is the mass of the galaxy. In, in my 
which one of these tidal streams and the trigger. Yes. So what's the size? In mass? Ah, what is the mass? Well, it depends on the body wavelength. If you if you choose like, for example, this kind of wavelength, the mass is not that small. The mass is like a ten to the six solar mass or so. But but it's spread over a pretty so it's 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 kind of diffuse, right? It's it's spread over basically a hundred percent. Compare that to a globular cluster. A globular cluster is ten to the six solar mass in one in one parsec. It's, it's, it's kind of the are sensitive to both the mass and the size. Sorry, tidal streams interaction with them in the perturbation. Yes, we looked into this for primordial black hole clusters. Yes, are sensitive to mm -hmm. both the mass and the size. And the size of yes. the So a hundred parsecs is way too big. It's, it's big. So yeah, each individual. Each, yeah, yeah each, each individual scatter would not actually do very much. So the only way you can actually hope to detect this is okay. by many, many scatter. So the um, the, <coughs> the tidal stream basically go around the galaxies many times. And so over time, if you accumulate all this effect, it's basically kind of like a random ball effect because this pattern is kind of random. So each scatter is small, but uh, you multiply it by root n, n is the number of scatter, and then you basically accumulate over time, which is actually detectable uh, for this kind of for this kind of mass for the axions. Uh, but again, uh, it is not very specific to looking for actually uh, vortex. What, you know, it's just looking for fluctuation in density. By the way, if you think about it, this is in, at some level is pretty, pretty dramatic. It's basically saying the density go from the typical, let's say, one GeV per centimeter cube all the way to zero. So it sounds dramatic. However, if you try to if you try to actually look for actual signal, you know, each individual scatter does not do a whole lot, uh, unfortunately. Um, experimental detection, I think that is something that we are actively thinking about, which is the following. Um, imagine you have you have built an axion detection experiment, um, and your halo actually looks like this. What does it mean? It means the following. Uh, it means basically, you know, the, the, the the canonical expectation as a function of time, and, and you plot the axion field, and of course the axion field just fluctuates. Uh, it oscillates in time, and the frequency is of course determined by m, the mass of the axion. With this kind of uh, interference pattern, actually, it should not look like this. It should actually look like this. It should look like this. So this, this, uh, constant period oscillation is always there, but the amplitude should be modulated. It should be something like that. These places where it actually is going to zero are basically those vortices. And then it could, and this amplitude modulation is completely stochastic, but it's something that's predictable. You can predict the two point correlation function in time and also in space. They are actually fairly distinctive. And so the challenge, if you want, is to ask, uh, knowing that the signal should look like this, uh, how should we be best use kind of the predicted two point correlation function to optimize the experimental detection? So that that is uh, ongoing work. That's what that's what we are actually thinking about. Um, and I, this is all I have to say on this particular topic. Uh, with, uh, I hope I have not exceeded my uh, twenty minutes. So now it might yeah. be that we are in one of the poles. The Earth is moving around the galaxy. If we are happy. We are here. Yeah. yeah. We are unlucky. Yes. Now it depends on the mass. Okay. So good. We just have to wait at the inverse of m. Right. So let's say let's say you are an ADM ex experimentalist. This is the mass you are after, ten to the minus six electron volt, because you are sensitive to this, this kind of frequency. Um, you don't have to wait very long. So let's say you are unlucky, you're here. You don't have to wait very, very long before you get here because how long do you have to wait? You have to wait basically, this the rolling wavelength divided by 200 kilometers per second. And so you don't have to wait very long. You, wait, you wait a little bit, you get out of it. Yeah. But this kind of pattern is always there. And in fact, from this point of view, uh, our thinking is it's best to think of uh, axion detection as the analog of um, what we do in CMB or radio interferometry, 
you are really measuring some kind of stochastic signal that has a definite two-point correlation function. That's that's the way to think about it. Because of this modulation and predicting the pattern. So but that's all I have to say because we don't have very concrete example on that yet. This is uh, what we are actively thinking about. Yeah, so this is all I have to say about wave that matter. Uh, if you are interested, the, the vortices, uh, they are discussed in this paper. I recently wrote a review on this subject. Uh, you can find a lot more information there. So let me, let me now completely switch subject on you. Uh, this, this was what I was originally planning to talk about, uh, lack of loss numbers. Um, um, and, and he had some interesting lessons for those of us who like to think about science theory as well, as you can see. Uh, what, what is a loss number? So let, let's do something that's more familiar. No? Let's do ENM. So this is an ENM example. Suppose you have some dielectric. You place it in some external constant electric field represented by this arrow. You know what's going to happen, right? Under that electric field, the charges inside the dielectric is going to get moved around a little bit. Maybe the positive charge will tend to accumulate here, the negative will tend to accumulate there. And what that creates is a response field from the dielectric that is dipolar, right? So that's very familiar. And this is the ENM example. It's basically the response of a material or an object to some external field. And it creates as a result some response field. Yeah. In this case, it's, if the electric field is a constant pointing in this direction, then it's a dipolar response. Okay, so in gravity, something very similar happens. So um, so in gravity, uh, you can decompose the gravitational potential phi, or you can think of phi as a metric perturbation in terms of spherical harmonics. So the tidal field, the external field in general, if you are looking at angular momentum R, will go right out to the L. So for example, uh, if you think about a, a quadrupole, then it will be out to the two, which is which is the, the lowest order gravitational tidal field you can have. And if you imagine putting your object, imagine that's the Earth, for example, uh, in the presence of this external tidal field, the Earth, together with its ocean, is going to get deformed. The mass distribution changes from spherical to something that's deformed. And the result is creating a, a corresponding multiple response field. And it would go, it would actually fall off like one over r to the l plus one. Okay. It's basically exactly the same as the ENM example, except in the ENM example, I was talking about l equals one. But in general, you can talk about any 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 multiple for your external tidal field. So that is the response. And so you can you can say at the end of the day, if you combine the external tidal field and the response, the uh, gravitational potential should look something like this. Yeah. Um, and 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 we are interested in basically this as in topics. So at large R, the external field grow with R. Uh, and the response field drop with R with this kind of power. The coefficient here is known as a lot number. If you want, in ENM, you would probably call that polarizability. Um, and in, in gravity, it's often called the lot number. And there's, of course, one lot number for each L. Uh, and if you just do dimensional analysis, this number is dimension four, right? If you compare this term with that term, Clearly, lambda has the dimension of size to the two L plus one. And so if you are asked to just make a guess without knowing anything about the material, just make a random guess, you would have guessed lambda would be the size of that object to the two L plus one. Of course, the precise precise number would depend on the nature of that object, how deformable it is and so on. But dimensional analysis will tell you it's the size of the two L plus one. Okay, so this is how it's defined. Um, and now let's think about a black hole now. So imagine I take the metric, I'm, 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 uh, 
I'm suppressing all the indices to make it simple looking. So this is the metric you expand around a black hole background, a small perturbation. Phi is basically my small perturbations around the small black hole background. If you take Einstein's equations and linearize with these small perturbations, you will get an equation that looks like this. It's not a massless looking thing. There's a potential, and basically the potential is because of the black hole background. Right? If you were in Minkowski space, that potential would be absent. But because of the black hole background, you have some kind of potential for your metric fluctuations. You will be solving an equation something like this, schematically. Okay. Um, and now you basically do the following exercise. You say, let me impose phi goes as the tidal field out of the L as large distance, number one. And let me insist whatever this metric perturbation is, is regular at the horizon, doesn't blow up. It turns out if you now do the calculation, solve this equation, you would actually find lambda has to be zero for the black hole. And it's, it's, it's a result that is actually uh, very old, <coughs> discussed by many papers. I, I uh, quoted some of them here. So it's a well-known fact that this tail, this response field, this particular tail is just absent. It's not there for black hole. Um, so this is often referred to as the vanishing of the log number for the black hole, uh, which is not true, for example, for the Earth and basically a star. Most objects would not, would not have this behavior. Black hole has this very strange, strange behavior. And strange now in the sense that I think we, we, we like to think of about, uh, in a, in a, from a high energy theory perspective, strange in the following sense. It almost looks like a naturalist problem. Uh, and, and, and you can make it look like that by, by thinking about the problem as follows. Um, Imagine you think of the black hole as a point object, so you zoom out, you write down the world line action for that point object. Uh, it turns out the log number is in fact a coupling of this particular operator on the world line. This is something that you can show. Um, and then the vanishing of the log number becomes a, a question about, okay, if I write down the, the action for this object, uh, why does this happen to vanish? Why, why are these operators not there? Uh, what is so special about this particular object, which is a black hole? So, um, so that's, that's the question that motivated us to, to think about, think about what is behind the vanishing of black hole. Uh, and just to say, I'm, I'm clearly over, oversimplifying. I'm using five as my stand-in for metric perturbations. And of course, it has indices. And so if you want to be more precise, really what should fit in here, uh, basically the biotensors and derivatives thereof. And if you take the biotensor project into the rest frame of the objects, there are different projections you can do. And you can divide it into tidal field of the electric kind and the, and the magnetic kind. But let me not go into that because um, counting derivatives as, as such, this is, this is the right. Is the right kind of thing. <coughs> okay, I'm skipping all the indices to make it simple. Okay, so in general, if you are more careful, there will be different kind of log numbers. There will be the electric log number and the magnetic log number, which what your black hole or curved black hole. There are even more possible log numbers. They all vanish. And the question is, you know, uh, from a high energy physics perspective, we would like to understand what's going on. Uh, what is behind this? But rather than an optimist issue, I would say it's more like a symmetry issue. Right? Yeah, the question is what is the symmetry? Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. So that's what we are after. We're trying to find the symmetry behind it. Uh, in fact, at some level, it would be more interesting if we cannot find the symmetry because it would be an example where some, something vanishes without a symmetry. But we actually found the symmetry here. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, just to show you there are actually details, uh, I, I don't want to overwhelm you with the Tarkovsky equation. This is the Tarkovsky equation. It doesn't really matter um, the precise form. And, but I want to tell you just roughly what, what, what are the steps that go into writing down this equation, right? So you, you take the biotensor and you project onto the now, some now tetra. 
you get what are called human pyrosphere, which are this spine. You decompose, you decompose into uh, spheroidal harmonics, and then you write down this equation for curved background. So this, if you want, this equation is a more precise form of this schematic sketch that I just wrote here. This is a more precise equation. And this equation is very rich in structure. I just want to point out a few things. Number one, uh, when I when we talk about log numbers, we are always imagining the tidal field is static. Uh, you can you can think about dynamical tidal field that's more complicated and interesting, but let's do static. So you you, you set the time derivative to zero. Um, there is this quantity s, which is actually the spin. It turns out the same equation describes both spin zero, scalar field, spin one. Um, about the field and spin two, which is the gravitational perturbations, is exactly the same equation. You just have to change s from zero to two. Uh, the L and M are clearly the angular momentum quantum number because you have expanded in uh, in, in spin weighted spherical harmonics. Uh, A is the spin of the black hole. R s is the Schwarzschild radius. The equation look like this, and delta is some quantity which is like so. It vanishes at the horizon. Okay, so the equation looks complicated and and forbidding. I mean, some, somehow it looks it looks difficult to solve. Uh, what I want to do is to point out a few steps that make it actually very easy to see what is the symmetry. So uh, number one, it turns out it turns out there is a ladder structure. Which allows you to take go between solution of a given spin to another spin. You can go from scalar solutions to spin two by applying basically derivatives and multiplying by polynomials that are. It turns out this is something that can be done. Um, and, and this can be done exactly uh, for zero frequency for static solutions. And it generalizes what is known in the literature calls the Robinsky Tarkovsky identity, where, where what they pointed out a long time ago is you can go from s equals minus two to two, but the fact that you can go from s equals two to s equals zero uh, somehow was not appreciated. You can actually do that for static perturbations. So that's number one. So knowing that is true, let me just consider s equals zero because once you have that. It's very easy to find out what happens to spin two just by applying certain operators. So if you put s equals zero, already this term disappear, that term disappear. This is just l times l plus one, which we recognize. Um, and um, I'm going to further, and this is purely for, for pedagogical reason, set the spin of the battle to zero and to get rid of that as well. Uh, you can run the argument that I'm going to tell you next. For a curved black hole, it's not a problem, but it's just the expressions are more complicated. So I'm going to do that now. So I'm going to set s to zero and the spin to zero, and let's look at what's going on. And the equation is so simple, you can almost uh, see the answer. Um, this is the equation. If you do that, that's the equation. Again, this equation is nothing other than box by equals zero in a Schwarzschild background. This is for spin zero spin of the of the fluctuations and spin of the black hole. Delta here is the only quantity that knows about the black hole geometry, which is basically this combination. And this combination vanishes at the horizon. Okay. So this is the equations you are after. And it's not hard to see uh, what kind of solutions you're going to get, especially if you actually set one more thing to zero. The one more thing you can set to zero is L, L no? Let's do that. Uh, just to just as a warm up. So if I said, uh, actually, let, before I do that, sorry, I, 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 I skip ahead. Um, before we do that, let's look at the asymptotic. So for arbitrary L, you can look at basically this solution either far away <coughs> or close to the horizon. And it's very easy to see this is a second order differential equation that must be two independent solutions. At last distance, it has to go like this asymptotics I already referred to earlier. R to the L or one over R to the L plus one. Close to the horizon, it has to go like either a constant or a log. The log is something you don't want that blows up at the horizon. Okay. And these are the general asymptotics. 
far away and at the horizon. And in general, you should have some linear combination of the two. That's what you should have. Um, and now let's let's rephrase the log number problem in a way that make it actually look almost like a scattering problem. The, the log number problem is the following. Suppose I insist the scalar field is regular the horizon, which means I want to throw away the log. And so at the horizon is some constant. Uh, interestingly, when you go to far away, it actually goes to only one of these two possible branches of solution, how to get This tail is not there. The fact that this tail is not there is precisely the vanishing of the log number. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So the vanishing of log number at the level of just looking at the equation is basically, if you want, the little bit of a surprise, which is one particular branch on the left connect to one particular branch on the right. Why does that happen? Basically, that's what you want to know. Of course, you can just solve the equation because it's so simple. You can see that this is going to happen. The question is, we want to ask kind of a deeper question. Why does that happen? What is the symmetry reason behind this? And here I find actually thinking about scattering helpful. So imagine you are thinking of, thank you. Imagine you are doing a, a scattering problem. Um, and usually if you have a thing about you do quantum mechanics, you have a potential and you do scattering problems. If you stand in a wave like this here, you will have a transmitted wave, but you will also have a reflected wave. So in general, if you assume one branch of the solution, which is a right away wave here, on the other side, you should have both. That's kind of the general phenomenon. To have this behavior is rather analogous to say, uh, you have the potential, you have scattering, but this is not there. There's no reflection. You have one branch of solution, right going wave on the left, and right going wave on the left. It's, it's basically like that. And you want to explain that. You want to see, okay, why does it behave like that? And the reason is actually fairly simple. Uh, for L with zero, it's almost trivial. Let's say L with zero. This is your solution. And if you just look at, at sorry, this is your equation of motion, and you look at stare at this equation, clearly there's a conserved quantity, which I call P0 here. This is conserved in the sense it's out independent. Yeah, it's a conserved quantity. And it turns out you can you can check very easily this conservatively following from this symmetry, which is changing by by this amount. Um and and is it's a symmetry, a good symmetry at the level of the action you can check. And now the vanishing of log number is actually very simple. Once you know there is this conserved quantity, you just check. Well, if I insist on regularity of the horizon, which means phi is equal to constant, I evaluate the conserved quantity at the horizon. I know you get zero, the derivative of the constant will get zero. And since I know it's conserved, it better be true, whatever this solution, no matter how it behaves, on the far right, I should still get zero for P zero. And it turns out the only way that happens is that this tail is not there. Hence the vanishing of the log number. And so th this phenomenon of having one branch on the left and only one branch on the right boils down to the conservation of this quantity. And it's very easy to see for everything's zero. Um, and then you might ask, okay, that sounds nice, but does it generalize the higher harmonics? And it turns out there, there is some uh, surprising structure in the um, perturbations around a black hole. And there is some ladder structure that we could use. Um, it turns out there are these operators you can write down that allows you to go from solution at level L to solution at L plus one or vice versa. This is raising this lowering operator. And they take this kind of form. So there's one derivative. And then plus basically polynomials. Uh, and then once you once you realize this letter structure is there, it's not hard to guess what the corresponding conserved quantity at non-zero L should be. You just take your level L solution, you lower it all the way to zero, and then you just apply this operator that must be conserved. That's it. It's as simple as that. The symmetry. It's a little bit involved. The symmetry is 
We take the level L solution, you lower it to zero, apply the same operator, which is here, and then you raise it back. That is the symmetry. Very simple. If you if you if you are familiar with higher spin symmetries in the Minkowski space, this is actually kind of reminiscent of that. In fact, even the derivative counting is actually the same. Um, it's, it's, it's reminiscent of that. And it's so, so that's it. If you are able to use this conservancy, you can run the same argument and show um, this branch must connect to only the R to the L, but not one of our R to the L plus one branch. Uh, since I have only two minutes, I'll, I'll just end with maybe this. This letter structure, just some brief comments. This letter structure, you might ask, where does it come from? Uh, it sounds a little bit surprising that it can be done. And indeed it is, but there is actually a geometric reason to come down. So you can show the letter structure as a geometric origin. It turns out a static scalar in a short field background is used to suitable rescaling. Effectively lives in a 3D hyperbolic space or Euclidean ADX. And the letter structure basically follows from uh, the translation killing vector of the 3D hyperbolic space, or you can think of it as a conformal killing vector at the original space without the rescaling. And it turns out if you work out what this does, it actually explains where this letter structure comes from. So in, that, that, there's this interesting connection, if you like, between a black hole and a cylinder space somehow, uh, at least for static scale. Uh, and furthermore, there are even more things, interesting things you can say. The data structure actually implies some form of supersymmetry, that these levels come in pairs. And in fact, if you are clever in choosing your coordinate, the potential in this equation can be shown to take the Porsche Taylor form, which you might you might recognize. A Porsche Taylor potential is precisely the kind of potential where this happens. Yeah, it's a reflectionless potential. And so, uh, one way to say all these that I said before is to say, well, look, you have the Porsche Taylor potential. Um, lastly, uh, let me end with this. A large R, the uh, this geometric symmetry actually takes the form of a 3D special conformal transformation. And you can use that at the level of the word line action to explain why those couplings are not there, at least for the scale. Um, and you can also use the same kind of argument to talk about actual node there, but let, let me not go there. That's it, that's the end. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, so I see a question by Jan there. Uh, if you have a question disk of uh, that matter one, is the left number still zero? If, uh, if, there, if there is uh, other envir environmental stuff, um, let me think about this. Then it depends on how you actually define it. If, if the log number is really strictly the number of the black hole itself, it's still zero. But if you think of the, the, the black hole, Together with the environmental disk, let's say, as one object as a whole, no, the log number is not zero, just because the disk would get deformed. Yeah, it would, it would have a tidal response. But it's not so much that whole itself as a tidal response. It's and just the disk. If in the future we get access to such precision? Yeah, it turns out the uh, the projection for the, for the future is actually pretty good. That these log numbers can be measured with pretty high precision. Meaning, um, if you if you think about a neutron star, for example, which has non-zero log number, the projection is that you can actually measure that log number for a neutron star to the precision of percent precision in the future. Yeah. For the black hole, we expect it to not be there, but it would be nice to check it. So, what's the connection between the size of the log number and the soft breaking of that symmetry? The soft breaking. Imagine you have a symmetry. And you know that it, nice. it's not exactly a black hole. Imagine you have, you have a star, star, you have a star, or a star, whatever, yes. which is almost as close as a black hole. Yes. Can yes. you then project out the love numbers? Yeah, very nice, very nice. Um, let's say let's say you have a star, right? So um, if you if you have a, if you have a star, and let's pretend this star is pretty really symmetric, and so outside the star is still the quadratic metric. So. Almost this, 
Exactly the same in quotes as regularity at the bottom. There's no change there. Exactly, exactly, exactly. The, the, the equation is the same exterior. The only difference is the boundary condition. That's right. Yeah. And basically, uh, the fact that you get non zero log number is because of the boundary condition. And, and if you phrase it that way, it is a spontaneous breaking actually of this symmetry. And if you want to account for it, probably what you want to do is to account for the dynamics of this surface. And so you should you should introduce an additional field, which is some kind of gold zone that actually now maybe have realized this symmetry. And that's probably that's probably the way to think about it. It would be nice because neutral stars are not that far from black holes, so it would be great to make the prediction for the log numbers mm -hmm. given the question of state of neutral stars. And then you would say, fine, if I measure that, I'll have a yeah, it certainly can be phrased in that language. But if you really want to make a prediction, you know, your neutron star, how deformed is it going to be? Of course, you really should do the UV calculation to match from the EFT description. Okay, but right. so I think we need to move on.